the relationships you have during the process, priceless. Hello. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 308. Today, we're joined by Sifu T.W. Smith. If you don't know my voice, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show here. I'm the founder at Whistlekick. We make sparring gear. We make apparel. We make training accessories. We make a bunch of stuff. But to be perfectly honest, the thing I am most proud of, the thing that we are probably best known for, is this show. Because we put out two episodes a week. We bring you an interview every Monday. We bring you some kind of topic on Thursday, whether it's something I feel compelled to talk about, or maybe it's a profile of someone famous from history, or just something else that you should know. Here, of course, this is a Monday release. We're joined by an amazing guest, and I know you're going to love today's episode. You can find the show notes as well as sign up for our newsletter at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all of our products at whistlekick.com, and a number of them are even available on Amazon. Now, if you're a fan of martial arts podcasts in general, you probably know today's guest. Sifu T.W. Smith is the host of Kung Fu Podcasts, which is an exceptional show. And I was so honored that he accepted the invitation to come onto our show, and I had a wonderful conversation with him. It was from an episode with Sifu Smith and Sensei Ando that I really kind of escalated my goal in bringing Sifu Smith on the show, wanted to have him on. And he's been on the list for a while. In fact, there are a lot of people on the list. It's a growing list. You would think it would be shrinking over time, but it's not because I become exposed. I, I hear about, I read about, listen to all these wonderful martial artists. But there were some things that Sifu Smith said in this episode with Sensei Ando that just made me say, you know, we have to move this guy up the list. It has to happen soon, as soon as possible. And that brings us to today. Sifu Smith is as open as anyone we've had on the show, and he connects dots about being a martial artist in a way that very few others do. It's approachable, it's insightful, and it's entertaining. If you haven't listened to his show, I hope you will. But for now, I give you our conversation. Hey, Sifu Smith, how are you? Hey, doing well. And please, uh, just, uh, you can just call me Tim or T.W., Whatever, whatever works for you. Okay. Well, now, yeah. now that I have your permission to do so, it, you know, the, the irony there is that I don't really need to refer to you again, because we're just you and I. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, um, you know, first, uh, before, you know, kind of getting, getting along, I, I've, you know, just kind of did a, a few minutes of uh, looking at some of your work. And I had heard you once or twice on a another program. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but uh, I was really impressed with your uh, approach. And uh, and then it, w- it really wasn't until just a couple of days ago that I realized that Whistle Kick had its own apparel and, you know, a whole nother model that were operated with it. And I, that was, and it looks really good. Well, thank you. So uh, means a lot. Uh, I'm interested at, at some point, uh, whether it's through this conversation or a little bit in the future is to uh, explore that because, you know, I have my own Kung Fu school, my own martial arts school here in Raleigh and uh, getting gear is something that, uh, you know, I, I need. And I also need, uh, and currently I've been working with AWMA for years, but uh, uh, to be honest with you, I, I just soon work with somebody who I can get to know and uh, know a little bit better. Sure. Well, you know, that, that would be an honor. Um, yeah, it's it's a whole different business model, and and to be perfectly frank, the podcast started out of necessity because I couldn't find a platform that we could leverage to get exposure, because mm-hmm. as martial artists, we're so fragmented. Yes. Hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, you know, it, honestly, it was a friend of mine was slated to host the show. We were just going to put the resources behind it, and then just before we really got going, he had a near death episode of a stroke mm. uh at 45 mm. you know, mm. and and so i ended up stepping in and here we are three years later and, and my life has changed completely mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. well so you started your podcast about the same time as kung fu podcast started and um about 2013 
Oh, you're 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 before us. You're somebody okay. before us. It, um, actually, I, th- I think just about everybody came before us. Mm. Uh, but but the one thing I, I think we might make up for in in uh, age is frequency. Yes, and while you're while while you're on the uh, when we're actually hit the record button, which you can hit any time, um, um, that'd be something that I would really enjoy picking up to as far as Kung Fu podcasts. Uh, and oh, how how am I trying to work out content? Uh, and because I have gone through some really stressful times of managing the content for Kung Fu Podcasts, and uh, it's a as as you well know, uh, besides trying to deal with technological issues that uh, you know you get ready like today, I get ready to crank up my my Skype, and it says, "Oh, you have an update to install," and that always makes me shiver because I'm uh, always concerned about what's not going to work after that happens. But uh, right. trying to make make a uh, podcast run regularly and consistently um, is tough. I have 15 years of IT. I have a full time engineer person on the back end dealing with you know everything that happens outside of the recording, and then we just brought on a part timer to do some scripting for some of our, our Thursday, our content episodes. So I don't know how I would do it otherwise at this point, mm. because just the, when I, when I first handed off some of the back back end stuff, it became, I mean, I got back 20 hours a week. Yeah. It, it was insane yeah. how much, you know, I didn't, yeah. I don't think I fully realized how much time it was taking me. Yeah. Well, see, are you have you already hit record? Because to me, these things are the things I'd love to have people out there. You well, know, you you get to know a little bit about sure. you too. You know, to to be perfectly honest, record starts the moment I call you. The software oh, does that automatically, so we can just kind of leave this in. I know you, you probably know just as well as I do that listeners kind of love this behind the scenes. You know, they, they feel like they're getting some some secret info. So we'll just go ahead and leave this stuff in. And sure, sure, that's great because I I do I. Uh, you know, one of the things that helped me a lot um, was getting to talk with Ian Abernathy a few times because I had heard his podcasts. Uh, or there was one podcast that really triggered me, and then I had to start getting some education. And it kind of relates to martial arts. What I did is I took uh, my previous training in working in the hospitals and clinics and then the martial arts training and tried to work out a methodology to to develop podcast and and I chose podcasting because I seem to have more of a knack in communicating through my voice than I do through writing and part of that is because I write like I talk and that's not always you know the voice that you you can use and the fact that I have a little bit of a North Carolinian accent that is not too too rash I have some of my relatives where I can barely sit in the room with them for too much time uh, before my ears start to uh, uh, scream for, for some peace. Uh, you know, and I, I explain it to folks in the sense that, you know, I was growing up here in North Carolina and we had about three TV stations. And uh, I was telling my students the other day, I remember one of my first and favorite gifts that my mom and dad got us was uh, back in the day, uh, we lived out in the country. Uh, my dad was working out at the turkey farm and a gas station out in Rayford, North Carolina. And anytime we wanted to turn the channel from like channel five to channel 11, uh, I had to go outside. And back in those days, we had what looked to be the Starship Enterprise uh, antenna on top of the house. It was a massive looking you know, tubular looking thing. It literally looked like something on a, on a battleship back in the old days. And, uh, it was on a tubular steel pole that ran all the way to the ground. And dad would say, okay, we're going to go turn the channel. Uh, so like, maybe we're going to watch a football game or something, right. Or watch Muhammad Ali boxing. And, uh, so I'd have to go outside and grab it with my two hands and turn that tube in, in a direction to where the channel would start to come in. And dad would be at the window or have the front door open and he'd yell through the screen door, you almost got it. You almost got it. 
And the uh, when I had it, he said, no, 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 go back just a little bit. Boom. And we'd get the antenna. Well, one of my favorite gifts was one day dad came home and he had this little thing. It looked like a little black box uh, with a bunch of wires in it. And it was a rotor that you connected and you put beside your TV and it had like a compass on it. And the other end of it had this motor that connected to a wood pole that connected to that tubular thing. And when you would turn, say, from northeast to south, he would actually grab a hold of the pole and turn it. Uh, and I remember thinking, oh, my days of antenna turning is actually over now. I was so grateful uh, for, for the advancement of modern technology. And I don't know what I don't know why that triggered triggered my thought into it, except for the fact that, you know, martial arts to me was always this systematic work through work through certain things. And every now and then you might have this advancement, um, you know, uh, in regards to your ability to do something faster or your ability to do something uh, with a different type of objective. And I just recall that being one of those uh, reflective moments when I was telling my students that, you know, the, there were there are certain times in your life you have these little epiphanies and these little moments that bring a lot of happiness to you. And that just happened to be one of mine as I reflect back. Yeah, I, I had a similar setup, not not that we had to turn outside, but I also grew up in a rural area in Maine. And I, I remember distinctly there were shows that I wanted to watch badly enough that it wasn't unless I was physically touching the antenna that the signal would come through well. And I just stood there, you know, stretched back, holding on to the antenna, much to mm. my mother's chagrin, because, <laughs> you know, I'm going to I'm going to go blind sitting that close. Right. Oh, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. well, I remember I, I recall now because what I had what had triggered my thoughts into it is growing up in the country was is that uh, I used to watch the Andy Griffith show. And when I was growing up. I, for whatever reason, even by the time I was eight or nine, I used to watch that show and I used to think to myself, you know, when I grow up, I want to be able to talk more like Andy because I had a lot of relatives who talked like Gomer and Goober and their voices, their, their, their over countryfied voices, which are not, you know, they, their characters had these voices that, um, uh, I just didn't want to sound like that. It's not that it was wrong or bad, but that's not how I wanted to to present myself. And so I used to watch the Andy Griffith show, not just for the stories, but to listen to Andy, how he would tell a story to Opie or uh, explain things. And and he always resonated with me. And uh, part of the reason that it triggered my mind is because I used to have to go turn the antenna in order to watch that show. Uh, but uh Kung Fu Podcast, my voice and trying to develop me a platform to express my thoughts and feelings about the martial arts. Um, I have, like I said, at first I thought about trying to do a blog work, but it, it didn't really work out for me that well. And when I found the voice of uh, learning how to do podcasts, and I heard Ian's uh, pretty much his call of responsibility is how I would put it is basically where he was making a comment one time on a podcast that if, you know, if you're not out there trying to support the, as you put it, fragmented individual good martial artists who are trying to get doing a good job, then uh, you're contributing to the problem. And that really resonated with me because there's one thing that I do not like to do, and that's contribute to my problems or to anyone else's. Uh, so I thought, you know, I've got to figure out something that works. And I started studying um, uh, Cliff Ravenscraft and I exchanged some emails and I uh, was uh, studying him on how to do podcasting. Uh, and he's a professional in the area and has taught a lot of people. Uh, okay. So, you know, I just kept working in that area. Sure. Sure. You know, it, it's. A lot of times we'll, we'll get some feedback, you know, some questioning. Uh, whether that's people on our team or people that are, you know, paying attention to what we're doing. And they'll look at something like, you know, us, me having you on our show, you know, and in a sense, you and I, we could be termed competitors. We both have a martial arts podcast and very akin to someone who might say, 
go out to dinner with someone who owns a martial arts school in the same town. You could look at it as competition. But Mm -hmm. there are a couple things that I always respond with. And the first is, where do you see every Burger King restaurant? Right next to a McDonald's. There's, a, there's an awareness that happens when more people are doing similar things in the area. The rising tide lifts all ships. Mm-hmm. And then secondly, our business model is really simple. If it gets people into martial arts or keeps them in martial arts, we'll do it. And that means the more good martial arts podcasts that are out there, the better. I would love for there to be so many great podcasts out there that nobody pays attention to us. I, I would actually consider that in a sense of victory because it would mean we, we helped elevate the awareness of martial arts podcasts to that point. Mm-hmm. I would agree. I, I, it's not always easy to uh, see that type of relationship with one another. When I think of, uh, you know, when I was talking with Sensei Ando not long ago, or um, uh, I've had Ian on the program and some others uh, occasionally, uh, not the awareness that bringing martial arts to a different place as far as uh, culturally and, and society in the 21st century um, is, uh, you know, it, it's not an easy responsibility to take either. I mean, it is, when I say that, you know, you, anytime you put yourself out there, you're putting yourself out there. Uh, and there's a lot of folks who still will still like to, uh, uh, I guess like what you were saying before is uh, hold on to their little share of the world uh, with gritted teeth and gouging fingernails into it <laughs> so that, uh, you know, it's like a, they own the martial arts and everything to do with, for example, self-defense or um, um, history or whatever else, and they don't want to share. And that's part of the beauty of uh, – uh, like working with a lot of the scholars that I do at Kung Fu Podcast is, uh, you know, Dr. Ben Judkins, Dr. Paul Bowman, uh, Kevin Tan. Uh, I've got I've got a laundry list of new folks that I've been um, uh, talking with over the past, gosh, well, several years. But it's taken me three years to get my next podcast. Actually, when you dial, when you called, I was putting these finishing touches on a program that I've been working on literally for at least two years. And I know I talked to Ian about it over a year and a half ago to two years ago when I saw him up in uh, Franklin, North Carolina. And it's about the blend of Christianity and the martial arts and some of the some of the things that have gone on over the years with that and how martial art, how martial artists can participate in a number of different things. But no matter what you decide to do in your life, whether it's becoming a Christian or a Buddhist or practicing martial arts or not practicing martial arts, you know, uh, there's always going to be some who are going to be for you, and there's going to be some who are not going to be for you. And then there's going to be a few who are going to kind of throw you under the bus for making a choice at all. One of the things that seems to to happen, and it's not, it's certainly not just in martial arts, but, you know, this is one of the reasons you were someone that that we invited, that I invited personally onto the show, because you, in in my mind, you get it. And, and pretty early on, you, you already articulated that you found a way to improve your craft. You reached out to someone who was an expert in the industry. How could you become a better podcaster? And when people are confronted with, with challenge with other people that are good, possibly better than them at something, there are two responses. People either go and figure out how can they improve? How can they occupy a better place in the landscape? Or they clamp down and they try and build a fence. And mm-hmm. I don't, I don't click with the people who are building fences. Hmm. And that's a, that's a, yeah, I, I can see, I, I can see how you would say that because I would have the same feeling. I never thought about it that way, but you know, in my, in my world, there's a few things that I don't do personally. Uh, my students sometimes when we're talking is that, you know, I'm, I wasn't always the fastest. And there were many times that I had, uh, my, uh, martial arts classmates were better than I was in some cases. In fact, when I first began, all of them were better than I was. They were, many of them had several years of martial arts training from, from a variety of places. Uh, every one of them, except for one, uh, were 
Delta forces, special forces, or uh, some other form of military, whether it's Marine or whatever else. So they were also active. They were also very, very used to hand-to-hand combative skills, where I was a wrestler and a, and a football player and very used to getting, you know, say, tangled up from time to time. But um, they would uh, they would pound me into the dirt. But I had one thing that always worked for me, and that was I, I don't quit. I, I just keep working. I'm not as smart as some of the other guys. I'm not as fast. But uh, I know – I know that the two things I have to do is first have that work ethic that I just keep working on it. And then two, make sure I'm working in the right direction, uh, that I'm looking at the things that help me get from A to B and my pace, how fast I get there doesn't really matter to me. As long as I know I'm working in the right direction, uh, being effective in what I decide to try to work on. And then if I can get some help, you know, by listening to uh, someone like yourself, who are, you, you articulate yourself so well, and uh, and uh, people who are really good in, say, for example, in the martial arts are really good in podcasting, or like Dr. Ben Junkins, who's really, these guys who are really good at researching. In fact, they make their living as professors and going out there and, you know, scrubbing off the stillies and digging in the, digging in the, uh, in the dirt there to find you know, real artifacts and putting, putting, translating things that most of us could look at for the next three years and not be able to make anything of it. Uh, those kinds of guys, are, that's part of the reason that Kung Fu Podcast got started was because I was already doing the work and I was sitting there and I wrote Dr. Junkins one time and I said, you know, I'm already reading your work. And to be honest with you, it's hard to read uh, because he writes in a very scholarly tone. And a very, you know, that's what he is. And so I, and and he he wrote me back and he said, yeah, I could see how that would be a problem. And I said, because I'm kind of a bricklayer, I'm kind of a layman. And so would you mind if I started taking some of the works that you do and putting my voice to it and, and kind of translating your scholarship into what I would translate into a martial arts voice to, to someone like me who would make sense to, for example, Andy Griffith, that he could explain it. And uh, uh, and he was like, no, go for it. And it just kind of started from there. Mm. Now, we've already talked about the the hard work that having a podcast, it requires the time, the, the effort. And it's pretty clear why we have our podcast. You know, why am I doing this? But why are you doing this? What what made you say, you know, taking this work from others and, and translating it and and making it approachable to others? Why was that important to you? You know, it's all, I like knowing what I do has meaning. I also like to know that what I'm doing um, has a real fire behind it. And in some cases, like I, I want to say the word heritage, but uh, um, more of a um, uh, merit behind it. Uh, in some cases, it's also that so I can learn from the past. There are many times where I never really have the answers to how am I going to move forward with this. And in some cases, it's, it's a, being able to look at how others have handled similar circumstances in the past. You know, I tell my students that, um, you know, technology has changed a lot over the past couple thousand years, uh, but people really have not. You know, people people as a as a whole haven't really changed. It's part of the reason that the old documents like the Tao Te Ching, the Bible, uh, the Quran, or whatever other ancient sacred text you'd like to point to still has meaning. Because the soul is the soul and people's behavior and how we think about things a lot of times in the deep core of ourselves haven't changed a lot. So when I started Kung Fu Podcast, I wanted to be able to tell stories and share scholarship and understanding. And then some cases, you know, I would slip in and uh, like this next one here would have a lot of my own personal viewpoints where I could point to things in myself and my training. And I actually had another podcast for a little over a year. It was called the Podcast of Tibetan Kung Fu. That was all just me personally. 
and a lot of my personal stories and the things that were going here at the school. But I wanted to have something that I could share with others. They could take it or leave it. Uh, I was very, very, um, I, I, I purposely called it Kung Fu Podcast because I didn't want, I didn't want it to be tied to my school at the time. I wanted to do something that was just, I don't want to say, I, I just want to do something that was there to support people who had an interest in understanding more than just the fastest way to throw the punch or the best techniques or what's the best style or the sporting world of the MMA. You know, I wanted some and people who were already doing work in the area and it, and it resonated with me. And I know that was a long winded answer, but um, unfortunately, I am a little long winded from time to time. No worries at all. Long winded answers and tangents. Those are the hallmark of this <laughs> show. Uh, and and for anyone that hasn't seen it, that hasn't really dug back. I want what episode was it? I'm trying to remember um, when Tony Blower came on. Mm. Uh, we got through three questions and it was two and a half hours. Mm. I mean, the, I, I just I just st stood back and the man just went. And he gave mm. a master class on his entire philosophy. And we, we ended up splitting it into two parts. And, it was, and I mm. love that because I feel strongly that when people kind of wander, when people have the space to just talk, they end up in places that they don't always realize they're going to go, which is good for not only me as the interviewer and the listeners, but also you as the guest. I can't tell you how many people, and maybe you've even had this happen, where after we wrap the show, a guest will say to me, I hadn't thought about that story in 20 years. Mm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to they, me, that's uh, fun. That way, everyone is benefiting from the time. We uh, here at the school, we call that following the Tao, which basically means that, uh, you know, a river has a natural flow. Uh, sometimes just getting out of the way of it is uh, the most effective way to use it, uh, let, letting it do what it needs to do when it needs to do it. Uh, and in fact, anytime I've ever had anyone on the program, uh, I've tried to take a very, you know, I, I tried to take a professional approach to it. Uh, but even preparing, so for example, uh, for this program, I've always found that I prepare better by just settling my mind, make sure that I feel comfortable with who I'm talking with and what we're going to, what we're going to be talking about. And I'm always comfortable about talking I'm talking about Kung Fu podcast or martial arts or some of my personal theories or history in the martial arts. So I don't really have to prepare a whole lot for that except to uh, – and and to be honest with you, I don't really have any sort of agenda except to, sh to continue to try to share in a sincere and authentic manner that, you know, long after I'm dead, there's going to be people who are going to still uh, need to carry a torch. Uh, for martial arts. And I don't mean just martial arts like in schools. I mean the spirit of martial arts, trying to make yourself better. You know, I, I, since Ando and I were talking, I have the I have the blessed curse of having an addictive type of personality where I can get hyper-focused on things. And in many parts of my life, that was an absolute blessing because I could use that to become a very good wrestler and get wrestling scholarships, or I could use it to be a football player. And when I'm playing football season, that's all I would do. The way I train, the way I breathe, the way I eat, that's what I do. Um, then when I got to college, I you know, managed to scrape my way in and be one of the first men in my entire family's history to make it into college. Um, uh, you know, it was really, you know, just work on it and try to try to make my way through it. Uh, but uh, if we were uh, going to, how I, I'm trying to figure out how I would say it. Um, Take your time. Mm. Well, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. That's okay. I'm just making a note. You know, we'll we'll chop we'll chop that out. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you can roll back to wherever you want, or mm -hmm. I was trying to think about where where we were. This is the disadvantage that's going on in the roll. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Well, let's let's just pick it. Let's pick it up then. In in just I, I had a question yeah, that I wanted back. to ask you. Sure, go ahead. 
which was if you consider where you are as a martial artist now and all of that investment of creating your podcast and the mm-hmm. people that you've spoken with, the conversation, the hours of conversation and and likely even more hours of behind the scenes time between research and understanding and editing and everything. How have you as a martial artist changed from, you said, 2013 to now? Well, the first things that have happened is I've become much more mindful of various approaches to similar styles of martial arts. That's one. Uh, two, it's also made, aware, made me very aware of some of the oceans of differences to the same styles of martial arts, for example, Chinese martial arts. And then, then on the other side, it's also made me closer to people who I would have never thought were closer to my uh, martial arts family. And I would have never known otherwise. So as a martial artist, I've grown in the relationships that uh, uh, that I have and the nature of those relationships that I have. Uh, those relationships have helped me better become a better communicator, in some cases a much better listener. Uh, and as far as being something that was tangible, it's allowed me to look at application of martial arts from a variety of different reasons and historical reasons <clears throat> and objective reasons that uh, I would not have had otherwise because I had strictly came from a Chinese martial arts background uh, and the Chinese martial arts in itself has its own click sort of say, you know, you got people who are, you know, it's all about the movies. When you say Kung Fu today, you know, it's almost like it's associated with the movies or uh, some other type of um, uh, presentational type of stuff where it's out there in the uh, looking at it from a from a movie screen perspective. Uh, but, uh, you know, when I was learning Kung Fu, it was the three versions was for 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 health, for sure, for fighting. And we were we were taught several like the lion dance or the dragon dancing that you might see. That's for show. But you knew what you were doing at the time when you practice it. And today or not today, but when Kung Fu podcast just started primarily, uh, one of the things that I was having a real issue with was how much. What do you say? I want to call it a poor translation. Of, of saying, you know, you, you're taking what is in sport and putting it over here. And and it's not that this isn't similar, but the objectives are different. And if you don't make that clear to someone when you're teaching them, uh, it can become a real liability and not an asset. Uh, knowing what you're trying to do is, is, is probably first and foremost more important than knowing a list of techniques to do. Uh, so as a as a martial artist, one of the things that's happened since I started Kung Fu Podcast is is put me in direct conversations and in direct interactions and in cases and in some cases direct physical contact with uh, other martial artists who you know you get a chance to uh, share, as we would say it, and uh, it's made me better in that way. When you think about those relationships, if we consider all of the assets that we have as martial artists, whether it's you know. Uh, experience and certain, uh, I guess it's all experiences, but if, if we think about, you know, knowledge of, of forms or, or basics or practical application or any of the other things that we can consider that are resources to us, relationship certainly is on the list, but it's not something that I think most, pe- most people would consider as an asset I, as a martial artist, am a better martial artist because of the people that I know that can help me and support me. How important would you say those relationships are to you as a martial artist? Uh, you know, it reminds me of one of those commercials, you know, you, a, a new a new Kung Fu jersey, a uh, hundred dollars, right? A new, new Kung Fu shoes and uh, some other stuff. You know, fifty dollars. Uh, you, you know, the relationships you have during the process, priceless. I right? um, because they're 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 extraordinarily important to me because they these are people. Well, one, 
like most relationships go, you need people who are in not in a place of authority, but in a place of sincere authenticity that they know what they're talking about. They may not be the, you know, the chief of some system or something, but they know what they're talking about. That's one. Two is that they are sincere when they share things with you. And then three is um, they allow you to massage yourself back and forth with them so that you can figure out how you are. I think it was Dr. Kevin Tan who once was writing um, that, you know, as martial artists, one of the biggest things that we do is we find ourselves. At some point in every martial arts journey that I've ever heard of, and you you know, you could probably tell me better than uh, anybody else because of all the folks you've spoken with over the years. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've never had anybody to practice martial arts and not find out something about themselves, whether they are afraid to get punched, whether they're afraid to administer pain, whether they're afraid to be injured, whether they didn't quite understand that there's more than just one objective in every combative situation. And if you don't know your objectives, you're more of a liability than an asset. And our ability to massage ourselves with someone else is what helps us define us. You can't find yourself on an island by yourself. You have to be able to communicate and have relationships with others and rub yourself against them, so to speak, metaphorically, in order to define who you're going to be. And that's how important those relationships are to me. It's clear that's something that you've thought about. So how do you take that knowledge into your school with your students who don't have the luxury that you and I have of getting to interview to speak with people from all over the world? You know, it's funny. Well, first is that uh, I generally will take and we do a couple of different things. And so when I'm teaching, for example, um, an objectives class, so we'll have an objective martial arts class. And then in that class, I may come in and say, okay, this month we're going to be working as a, with the idea that you're a bodyguard, that you're protecting someone else, not bodyguard necessarily that you're working for a senator, but you're a bodyguard today. And, uh, and I occasionally have these students who say, well, you know, I'm never going to be a bodyguard. And, and of course I will remind them that, Hey, you know, you're a son and occasionally you take your grandmother out over to the mall or look, I thought you were a dad. You know, when you signed up to be a dad, you signed up to be a bodyguard, whether you knew it or not. So uh, so in those cases, when I take an objective, an objectives class, I will refer to basically your background of skills. Do you have the ability to subdue someone? Do you have the ability to, you know, uh, translate any of your previous katas or styles into something that will help you? get through this particular scenario that we set up in class, okay? That's, so we have an objectives class. And then we also have just a, what I call, is basically the inverse to that. It's a, it's a personality class. So we're going to say, okay, here's the technique that uh, you're going to get. And so you showed them demonstrated technique. And immediately, you'll see personality. The people who like to strike will take it and you'll see them administer it in some way that's more of a, like an atimi or they'll use it as a um, uh, some sort of a joint strike. Others who are more of a grappler or wrestler type background and their personalities tend to be a little bit more uh, uh, get a hold and stay a hold. Uh, they'll take it and translate it into their uh, concepts. And so usually – my way of communicating the important relationships is first know yourself, who you are today. If you're more of a striker, yeah, we can see that very clearly. If you're more of a grappler, we can see that very clearly. And then I have them rotate through with one another. So they get used to having what, you know, a relationship, understanding other people's personalities throughout a class. And so they, you know, and everybody's responsible for taking care of themselves and their classmate at all times. But it's that exchange because, they, as you probably have witnessed before, you know, when you go to a lot of places, people will partner up with someone who they're familiar with. And they're always working with someone who they're familiar with. And they don't really explore past their own personality boundaries or the ones they, they already have relationships with because we're more comfortable with relationships that we already have. Yeah. 
Uh, and as compared to, okay, let me get a little bit further out there and see how, you know, this guy translates things. And of course, then you can also, you got to be careful too, because in the martial arts, I had this recently happen, you know, where some folks have a little bit more of an ego and they put a heavy hand on you, you know, just because they want to have a little bit more, uh, what do you say? Like, um, they're not, they're not watching out for who they're, who they're, uh, sharing with at the same time, which tells you a little bit about their personality at the time too. So, uh, no, all my students, when I'm translating that kind of concept into a class, it's always re going back and forth between personalities. What do you typically like to do in the martial arts? And then uh, objectives, irregardless of your personality, here's the objective. And you have to, you have to be able to go back and forth between these two things. So far today, we've been talking about, you know, kind of where you are now, where you've been in, in more recent history. But I want to go back. I want to go back to the beginning and give the listeners some context for how you started on this journey. You know, what, where were you? How, how old? Why? You know, fill in some of those gaps for us, if you will. Um, well, some of, it, some of it began, my dad died when I was really young. Uh, by really young, uh, and as far as a man goes, it's really young. Uh, I was 21. Uh, and it was difficult because as, that's about the age of life as a man. You generally think no, you know everything that you're going to need to know. And it's not until years later you realize you don't know anything. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, you're probably more of a liability to yourself than an asset at the age of 21 a lot of times. Uh, but uh, there were there were things that I didn't know what to do. And so I started looking into the church uh, and I found some good relationships, there, some good teachings there. And I also found some difficulties there, which is something that I'll be bringing up into the next podcast at Kung Fu Podcast. But the um, uh, so I moved from those challenges and I knew, as I said before, that I have a personality. I cannot not be doing something. If I don't have something to be working on, I tend to get myself into trouble. And so by getting myself into trouble, I mean, just basically not not working on things, not as productive as I could be or not doing things the way I would like to. Uh, when I was younger, that was could have been even more type of trouble. So by the time I was in my mid-20s, I knew that it wasn't working. I wasn't finding my way. I'd done bodybuilding for a while and had really enjoyed it, but my body was breaking down. And uh, uh, so I decided that I needed something that I needed to focus on. And I decided to start looking into martial arts, which I had never done. So I'm about 25 at that time. Uh, of course, again, we're back out in the country of North Carolina, so it's not easy to find anything, including a magazine about martial arts, much less a martial arts instructor. Um, but I, I've, I'm, I bumped into a guy who I'd met through one of my church relationships, who was practicing Tai Chi. And he started sharing some thoughts and philosophy with me and, and, and invited me over to his uh, house on Sundays. And I started there, and he, he declined to be my formal teacher, but more of just an introduction to some of the Chinese martial arts and studies. Uh, from there, I began looking further and deeper which took me about another year and a half to two years to find a teacher out in Fayetteville, North Carolina, who uh, was kind of teaching. He had a restaurant out there, and uh, he really wasn't formally taking students per se. You know, it wasn't like a big martial arts school like you would. I had bumped into along the way where they had a shopping center and all that kind of stuff that was already kind of happening there in the uh, late '80s or so, um, and. Uh, but once I got there and he said, why do you want to learn Kung Fu? And I said, I'm just trying to get to know myself. And um, he invited me to come over, uh, pretty much tortured me the next day of class with a long set of meditation and some Tai Chi. Uh, and But it was so difficult because it was supposed to be so easy in the sense that if you're comfortable in your own skin and you can sit down and get your mind to calm down and channel your thoughts. It's not really that hard. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> so I uh, ended up going, okay, obviously, whatever this is, this discomfort that I'm feeling by trying to be quiet and peaceful, 
is something that I need desperately because I don't have it. Um, and uh, I never stopped. So that got me started. I was probably in my late 20s by then um, when I was very formal in the training. And um, and I just never stopped. And I, later on, I moved to Texas and met a, developed another relationship uh, with a gentleman named Lampeng Jung. And he was interesting because he was a teacher of martial arts of, uh, of uh, martial arts at Shanghai University. And he and I used to go out and we'd teach each other how to speak a little bit. He didn't know English. I didn't know Mandarin. Uh, we would take, he was teaching me the long staff, the Shaolin long staff. He used to watch me practice and he'd come over and watch me. And uh, then he'd, he would invite me with his small group of other folks who lived in the same community to come over and practice Bakwa, Xing Yi, Tai Chi Chuan. Uh, but he personally liked to practice the long staff, Shaolin long staff. So uh, he would torture me with that. Now, by torture, I mean my body was not designed to handle that long staff in the beginning. It took a good eight or nine months of daily practice just to get my shoulders limbered up, uh, be able to articulate my waist in a way that I can move the staff around me. It was it was it was like its own kung fu teacher all by itself. But that's how I got started. Was just pretty much needing a path to stay on, finding something that eventually resonated with me, uh, something that met me with a personal challenge, not a physical challenge, a personal challenge in the sense that you know I could fight, and I I mean I I mean the guys who I was training with, yeah, they were better than I was physically, but with some training, I you know eventually I was as good as they were. Um, but, uh, it was the personal challenge of staying calmer, uh, keeping myself more focused, uh, uh, learning, learning how to express myself in a way with confidence and not being a, not feeling like I needed to attack any sort of, uh, um, threats or, or backing down because someone didn't agree with me or was putting me down. I needed some, I need to be armored with the ability to respond to things in a way that I had not been taught to taught previously. It's these origin stories that really, I feel mean a lot to me, to the listeners because they give us context. But I also think, and, and I'm, I'm curious your thoughts that so often what seems to be subtle when someone starts martial arts, you know, almost a nuance when we project out over the next, you know, few decades can be kind of a real world example of, you know, one degree of difference in a trajectory applied over miles and miles can really set you on a completely different path. Do you think there was any of that in there for you? I mean, had you not, you know, trained long staff with this gentleman, you know, would you be a completely different martial artist now? Oh, well, there's no doubt in that sense from a physical understanding and a, uh, I mean, just a biomechanical understanding of, of, uh, of things. Uh, the other thing to, for example, just using the long staff as a, as a, um, as a uh, variable in my training past, uh, when I'm teaching the long staff, one of the things that I teach and, and share with folks, and it's great to witness it in them, for example, is that. To use a long staff, you can have the physical technique. So I can physically show you this is what my hand is doing. Okay. And then you can objectively watch and see what the staff is doing. Okay. But how that works, how am I making that happen is the internal comfort. It's not anything magical. It's that you can take this physical objective technique that you can see tangibly and translate that into a mindset. And it was the mindset that when you grab a hold of that staff, if you grab it, grab it and try to be too loose with it, off it flies. If you're a little, even slightly trying too much to control it, it looks clumsy and choppy. You have to put your mind in a very fluid place that you're not trying to uh, the same way, like when, you, when you're t trying to apply a lot of your techniques, you can't look to force a technique to happen. You have to flow through. And then when that opportunity opens, you sink right into it 
as that opening happens. If you if you wait to see the opening, you're too late. If you're trying to force the opening, you're too early. And the mindset of and using the long staff when you get one hand or both hands on it has to be in a very fluid state, and that you're going to move from from phase to phase as it presents itself and your intention shows. So yeah, it would, that the long staff is a perfect example of a variable that changed everything I knew at that point in time. One of my favorite things to ask guests is around stories. I've told you anyone that's listened to even one episode of this show knows that it's really, it's the stories that drive what we're doing here. So I'd love for you to take a moment and tell us your favorite martial arts story from your time as a martial artist. Hmm. You know, I, I had thought about that. And, and to be honest with you, my favorite martial arts stories were the ones that didn't happen when we were, I, I without a lack of a better word, just beating on each other. Um, my favorite martial arts stories were the fact that over half of the martial arts or my understanding of the martial arts and how to apply them occurred at the dinner table after practice. We would sit down as a group and usually after, you know, there was five to seven of us um, and we had been outside and sweated it out. And then we would kind of wash off out there by the hose pipe and uh, uh, we would sit down at the dinner table and see if we would have cooked uh, maybe a meal, of some rice and, just something simple, uh, but it was usually, you know, filled with uh, some vegetables and a couple of meats or something, and um, we would have dinner together. And during those times, we would talk, and it was during those talks that you would learn even more about each other. Sure, I could tell you that, you know, the hardest I've ever been hit to this day, to this very day, was by one of my good classmates, Paul who was probably about five foot seven and 145 pounds. And he hit me one day with a, a llama pie hand that literally picked me off my feet at 220 pounds and pushed me against a brick wall that was about three and a half foot behind me. I've never been hit that hard in my life. Um, and I could tell you that George was clever. Kevin was fast and all these types of things. But to sit there at a dinner table and talk about life and that your ability to have perspective. And so Sifu would say things like, well, you know, you're sharing this story. And he would point to, for example, a flower vase on the table. And you say, Tim, what do you see? And, you know, I said, well, there's, you know, I see these three flowers and as this colors and this way. And, and, you know, the vase has this design at me. And then he would look over at Kevin, who was on the other side of the table from me and say, what do you see? And, he did that, and then he would always remind us that, you know, whenever you would take anything in your life, you have to take a moment and look at it from a variety of different perspectives. And through numbers of perspectives, what does this look like from if you were up at the ceiling looking down at it? What would it look like if you were from the floor looking up at it? Um, it's through these perspectives that you actually get a real, real idea about what it is that you actually thought you were looking at. And that speaks very much to what you and I were talking about earlier. It's the relationships I've built, built through the martial arts over the years of Kung Fu Podcast has provided me even more depth and understanding and perspectives on things that I thought I knew. But when you talk to someone like yourself or Ian or Ando or uh, some um, um, many of the other folks who are in the studies and the practice of the martial arts, uh, you you get to look at, for example, this flower vase uh, metaphorically um, from a number of angles. But those were my favorite stories. It was the relationships and the conversations and saying, OK, this is how you're going to use what you were just out there sweating on. Uh, and you're going to use it like I tell my students, you know, in a good Kung Fu class or a good martial arts class, you know, training isn't from five to six. What you learn is from five to six. Your practice, uh, if I teach you properly, you'll be able to apply what you've learned in many, many places of your life. Uh, and that's been invaluable to me. I, 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 I couldn't put a price tag on that. I know from your conversation with Sensei Ando, which was 
absolutely wonderful. And listeners, I'm, I'm going to link that in the show notes. I don't usually do things that give context via, you know, in that way. I don't generally prepare, but I, I feel that having that conversation to tie into this one will give you an even better understanding of today's guest. I knew going into our conversation today about that dinner conversation and how much you valued that. Do you think that's something that other martial arts schools should implement? Not necessarily getting together over meals, not that that they couldn't, but is that time outside of formal training, is that really that important? Well, you know, it's uh, one of those things I believe that is important if it's important to your propagation of the martial arts. And so it may not necessarily be something that's important to a good martial arts instructor who propagates him his way or propagates himself and his teaching in his own way. It's kind of like what you and I were saying in the beginning of this. You know, I wasn't a very good blogger, so I found podcasting as a platform. Uh, you found podcasting as a pl- platform somewhat by necessity to get exposure. Um, your ability to take what works for you to make sure that your message or your teaching gets across is very individualistic. And I wouldn't step across the line of saying this is the way you should do it. I would say that uh, being able to propagate yourself in a way and share your message sincerely and authentically with your students is extraordinarily important. And if you found that by uh, having quarterly meetings or uh, sharing more things through a group forum and things like that, then so be it. For me, because of how I was raised and how I value things, sitting down for a few minutes face to face and and whether it's for twenty minutes or or for two hours, I you know there's I guess you may have heard you know there's nothing more valuable to me than my time, and so sharing an hour with you, for example is very important to me because I respect you and I respect the work that you do. And I'm very appreciative that uh, you enjoyed the work that I've done. Uh, But uh, whether or not someone decides to uh, find their own way in sharing their message, uh, you know, I, 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 I like the idea that people have relationships with one another. And it's hard for me to imagine me not uh, having relationships with folks who are important to me, but not just sitting down and just having uh, some time with them. A wonderful parallel to what we were talking about before with the idea that these podcasts, by you and I exploring martial arts in this way, we've become better martial artists. We've established these relationships. And it's been, I, I I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, because it certainly holds true for me that it's been worthwhile. It's been a tremendous return on that investment of time. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Mm. Yes, sir. No, there's no doubt. You and and as to your point there, there's nothing that you're going to gain whether you decide to do it through martial arts or being a blacksmith or anything else uh, or a scholar, for example. Without that initial investment of time, there's a lot of inertia that has to be overcome in order to develop momentum. Uh, Knowledge base is one of them. Physical skills is another. Getting the tools to implement those skills and knowledge base is another one. Um, And that's true in the martial arts. You know, uh, if you find out that you're not as fast as some of the other people, then what do you have to do? You have to be able to feel better, you know, in the sense that you can you can sense what's happening uh, better than others because you may not be as fast as, as a reaction time. Um, you know, there's a number of things that we find out about ourselves in the martial arts that uh, whether you're practicing karate or, or kung fu or taekwondo, it doesn't matter. You know, you're going to have to f- develop your skill set, develop a knowledge base, understand what the theories and objectives are of that style and find your way to express it to the best of your ability. And and uh, and hopefully that will either make you better or um, one day, you know, you're carrying the light for someone else and you're teaching them uh, how to keep themselves safe or how to use their training to help them better themselves in other places of their lives. We've talked today about the importance of, of research and 
history and adding context to the martial arts. You've mentioned a few books, a few authors, doctors. Are there books out there that you might suggest to the listeners as a beginning into that, that realm if they want to explore that side of the martial arts? You know, I don't, I, I don't have any books off the top of my head that just pop right out and say, hey, yeah, you definitely need to read X, Y, Z. I, I think of it more uh, at this point as people. Uh, there's people that you might want to follow or research. You know, I would definitely recommend Ian Abernathy as one, uh, Jamie Club as another, uh, you, you know, uh, you, you know, uh, Jeremy as, as another, um, you know, people who have put in, whether it's through their writing, through their voice, uh, have put in sincere time and effort to, uh, share a real objective without trying to just over glorify something or beat someone else down with it or, you know, turning it, they sharing authentically, authentically and sincerely. And the only books that really changed, changed me, uh, coming through the martial arts first had nothing to do with, uh, martial arts per se. It was called the Tibetan book of living and dying. And at that time in my life, I had some things going on and, um, you know, that book really helped me kind of uh, reflect, and it continues to help me reflect. It's what I, you know, I just, I pick that book up about once a month. I flip over, over, open to a page. I don't think I just pick open a page, and whatever it is on that page is something I put in my, put in my thoughts of mine for that month. Um, uh, and uh, if I had anything, you know, to share or encourage any other martial artist to do is find people who are authentic and sincere about their work, who are good at their work, and follow them, uh, whether it's through the written word or, or, or their voices, but to, to just stay in touch with them and watch how they conduct themselves and how they uh, demonstrate themselves through their work. And you'll learn what you need to learn. When you look out into the future, what is it that, you're hoping to to achieve. I mean, you've you've done so much, you've shared so much, you've continued the legacy of martial arts in a way that very few people have done, and and you should be commended for that. And I, I hope you recognize that. But obviously, you haven't stopped. So I imagine that there are things that you're still hoping to make happen. What are those things? You know. I sometimes have a flaw, and that might be one of my biggest ones, is that my purpose generally is a little too uh, short-sighted, I'd say, in the sense that I don't think about things way too far out in front because I live with this idea that I don't have a promise that I'm going to be here. Uh, so I try to, to attack the month or two in front of me. Uh, so currently, and and sincerely, you know, I, I keep wanting to do my best job with Kung Fu Podcast and share things, and and I appreciate your compliments. I, I you know, and recognizing that you know I've perhaps filled some gaps here and there, but my 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 goal is to try to continue to share those messages and share things and help people uh, practice in the martial arts. I have gotten a lot of uh, um, joy. Here over the past couple of years of working with folks in more larger group settings, which I had not done before because I've been, you know, because of some of my other work, have been involved and in, and in asked to come out to teach at a uh, uh, jujitsu kai type of uh, conference, or you know, bring the Chinese martial arts, the fighting arts, to a combative platform uh, and teach. Okay, Lord, can you show us some of the Hopgar Lama Pai stuff and how do they approach things, or how how do you use the Shaolin longhand systems in order to make your martial arts better? Uh, I would like to continue to do that because I would be honest with you. There's a lot of times I I don't feel like the Chinese martial arts, from a practical, technical, uh, combative uh, of, of uh, system, gets as much exposure as I would like for it to. Uh, the, like I said earlier, a lot of times the kung fu 
becomes more dramatized in the movies and things like that than I really have an interest in. Uh, but I must say, based on some of the things I read, that one of my favorite kung fu martial artists in the years past was not Bruce Lee. I like Bruce Lee, but I love to watch Bolo. He was my man, right? When I would watch him practice or practice in the martial arts, I would just uh, watch him uh, and go, man, that that guy just looks like he would he would be a terror to walk in and go, okay, that's who you that's who you're uh, sparring with today, Bolo Young. Uh, but uh, in regards to uh, my my future, I want to just keep doing what I'm doing see what opportunities start to present themselves, uh, hopefully by getting around the country. Who knows? Maybe even I told Ian I was going to go over there one day and uh, see, him, see him over there one day. I've never been across the pond. But um, I, I would think probably just sharing the message on continuing and a bigger platform uh, would be one of my goals. Well, hopefully you pick up a number of listeners because, folks, if you are not checking out Sifu show, you really should be. It's it's a wonderful show, and one that I listen to. I, I not not every time because there are a lot. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of stuff <laughs> I'm trying to collate into my brain, and I don't drive as much as I used to. You know, I used to drive mm-hmm. a lot for work, and I could listen to everyone's everything, and it was great. But now I'm, I'm stuck at my desk in my pajamas most days. Uh, I can appreciate I can appreciate that very very much. If people want to get a hold of you, websites, social media, you know, whatever else, your show, how do they find you? Well, the easiest way is just go to KungFuPodcast.com and uh, shoot me a note from there. On social media, I pretty much have it streamlined now to TWSmith.info as my uh, handle on Facebook, um, uh, Twitter. Instagram, wherever, wherever it is, I, I have the same same social media handle on every platform. In fact, just so you know, I went over there on Facebook today and made sure that uh, Kung Fu Podcast T.W. Smith was linked up with Whistlekick. So uh, uh, I want to make sure that uh, uh, I get more and more connected. This is actually social media is something that I've had to take some real time to invest on how to how to learn to use it more effectively. But, uh, yeah, that's the easiest way to find me is Kung Fu Podcast dot com or uh, TWSmith.info. Great. And of course, we do link all that stuff over at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, so folks don't have to worry about jotting notes while they're jogging on a treadmill or whatever else. Mm. I really do appreciate your time today, and I would just like to ask you for one more thing, if I could be so bold, and that is what advice, what parting words would you give the folks listening today? You know, Well, Jeremy, first, thank you very much for the opportunity to come on your program. Uh, it means a lot to me. Um, and if I had one thing that, you know, I would encourage any martial artist to do in that is to uh, remind yourself every day about why you practice. And sometimes really remind yourself about why you practice. I think I saw something where you had posted, you know, why would a school reprimand a boy for standing up against a bully? Uh, you know, being a being a civilian and a civilian martial artist, uh, in my mind, carries a responsibility. And that responsibility is not that you just know how to punch and kick and fight. It is that you know how to conduct yourself with some sense of degree of honor, some sense of behavior of uh, respect, and that you would stand up a bully even if you did get reprimanded. And after, re- after you got reprimanded, you would do it again because you knew it was the right thing to do. Uh, so practice every day. Remember why you practice every day and then apply it whenever you get an opportunity without hesitation. It's no secret that I'm always looking at how to improve this show, whether on a technical level or honestly more so the way I conduct myself, the way I speak to the guests and just the various ways that the show can become better through my involvement. There are a handful of people that I look to as inspiration to become better. People that are my sort of mentors in the martial arts podcast space. Sifu Smith is one of those folks. His demeanor, his humility, 
the way he conducts himself in speaking with a guest or talking solo. I find all of it inspiring and motivating. And I hope that you took some of that same feeling from our conversation today. Hopefully you're leaving motivated and inspired about being a martial artist. Thank you, Sifu Smith, for coming on the show today. You can find the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com where we have some photos, links to websites we talked about, Sifu's social media, and a bunch of other stuff. You can get a hold of us, social media-wise, at Whistlekick, pretty much everywhere. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And remember, you can find our products at whistlekick.com or on Amazon. Thank you so much to everyone who has supported us, whether that's sharing out an episode or making a purchase. Truly, I'm honored. That's all I've got for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Bye.